I mean, it's, it, 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 welcome to um, uh, Department of Medicine Grand Rounds um, today, the I think first Grand Rounds of November. Um, it, it sort of seems almost silly to introduce our speaker today, although I um, want to appropriately honor her. However, if I, um, I gave Dr. Wenger's full biography with all of her awards, um, we would actually not have time for her to speak. But we are honored to have Dr. Nanette Wenger um, join us today for a grand rounds. She is, of course, a professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology at Emory, at, here at Emory, and a consultant to the Emory Heart and Vascular Center and the founding consultant of the Emory Women's Heart Center. She is also, of course, world renowned for her pioneering research um, on women and heart disease, on geriatric cardiac care and cardiac rehabilitation. And she has a lifelong commitment to promoting equitable care for all. Dr. Wenger has participated as author of um, many, many American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association clinical practice guidelines. She's a past chair, board of directors, Society for Women's Health Research. She serves on numerous editorial boards of uh, professional journals. And, uh, and again, we're lucky to have her here um, because she is a sought after lecturer. She has authored or co-authored more than 1700 scientific and review articles um, and book chapters. In addition, Dr. Wenger has received many, many awards. Just to cut to sort of a few of the more recent ones, in 2020, she received the American Heart Association's Eugene Brunwald Academic Mentoring Award. In 2021, the American Heart Association established the annual Dr. Nanette K. Wenger Award for the best scientific publication in cardiovascular disease in women. She has received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American College of Cardiology in 2022 and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the World Heart Federation. And if you've been watching your email, she was just she just received the Alma Morani Renaissance Woman Award, um, which is on, uh, given by the Women in uh, Medicine Legacy Foundation. Um, in addition, Dr. Wenger is um, a deeply appreciated um, uh, teacher. Um, she is um, a regular, uh, she appears regularly in the FOB 101 for resident conferences and is known for her clarity and her um, practical um, advice um, framed in really um, the best um, uh, uh, clinical science. And she has also been recognized for that, having received, again, many teaching awards, including the Emory Williams Distinguished Teaching Award uh, of the University and the Evangeline Papa George Alumni Teaching Award for the School of Medicine. So again, I could talk for a long time about Dr. Wenger, um, who is, again, deeply loved um, by uh, our um, faculty, fellows, residents, and students. But I will actually turn it over to her she is going to speak to us today about the 2023 ESC guidelines for the management of acute coronary syndromes. Wendy, thank you for that lovely introduction. It almost sounds like an obituary, but I assure you I am quite alive. But what we're going to talk about today is the 2023 ESC guidelines for the management of acute coronary syndromes. But why am I here in the US talking about the European Society of Cardiology guidelines? First, for the past two and a half years, I had the privilege of being on the writing group with my European colleagues. And as you will see, what we did is to establish a very different thought process and approach. And is that that I want to share with you. Uh, and these are my disclosures. This is the reference. All of the illustrations that I'll show you today are in print in this guideline, and they are available in the public space, so you can copy them and use them. And some of them you may even want to put on your handheld to use as you see patients with acute coronary syndromes. But if you think back to what we've done in the US, We've had separate guidelines for chest pain, for unstable angina, for NSTEMI, one of which I chaired, for STEMI, for arrhythmias, and for secondary prevention. Well, with my European colleagues, we decided we were going to put it all together into one document to make it better for use. And I'm not sure whether many of you realize that ESC headquarters is in Paris. And this was during COVID and we had Zoom calls. 
and morning in Paris was 1 a.m. my time. So for almost a year, I spent every other week 1 a.m. conferences uh, to get this document done. And I'll tell you, it was worth it. My European colleagues were fabulous. Now, what we went through is the concept that ACS is a spectrum. It starts with unstable angina, goes on to end STEMI and STEMI. We reviewed and actually in the manuscript cited 936 publications. It's a 107 page document that I'm going to try to summarize for you in about 40 minutes. But it is comprehensive patient management from admission to long-term management. But the thing that we did differently with our European colleagues it was there was a patient member of the writing group. So you will see patient perspective in some of the recommendations. And those are some of the things I think we would like to add on this side of the pond. There's a conceptual approach, and this is where I want you to go. Think ACS, and I'll go over that in more detail at the initial assessment. Think about invasive management. Think about that was a, a, a typo, a bit, think about anti-thrombotic therapy, think about revascularization, think about secondary prevention. And then there's a section on gaps in the evidence. And if any of you are looking for a research project, look at those gaps in the evidence. And there are a whole list of potential research projects for you to go. Now, most patients who come in with an acute coronary syndrome about 80% of them present with chest pain and pressure. And that's the emphasis that we had. But it's important that many patients have other symptoms. They have diaphoresis, they may have epigastric pain, they may have indigestion, they may have shoulder and arm pain. But if you query, chest pain or pressure is often a component. But the interesting feature is that what is more frequent, far more frequent in women than in men, complaints of dizziness, nausea, vomiting, jaw and neck pain, sudden onset of shortness of breath. And as I've shared with our colleagues in the emergency room, when a woman comes in with any acute symptom from the mandible to the umbilicus, think ACS, because that may be what you're looking at. And now this is the ACS of the initial presentation. And A is you're looking for an abnormal electrocardiogram. And you know all the guidelines say anyone who comes in with these acute symptoms has to have an ECG within 10 minutes of presentation. You want to look for evidence of ischemia. You want to look for any other abnormalities. C is the clinical context. What else is it that you know about the patient? So you're putting this acute episode in context. And then probably the most important is the S part to assess whether the patient is clinically and by vital signs stable or unstable, because that often is a very different pattern of management. Really simple, but every time you have ACS, these are the three things that I want you to think about. Now let's look at the spectrum. And this, this, this is the pattern of the illustrations that we've done throughout the manuscript. Clinical presentation, the patient, when you see him or her, may be asymptomatic. There may have been pain at home. The patient comes in now asymptomatic. There may be increasing pain. There may be persistent and worsening pain. Or the thing that you don't want to see, but sometimes we do, cardiogenic shock or the acute onset of heart failure. Or indeed, the patient may have survived an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Then you have the electrocardiogram, which may be normal. There may be some ST segment depression. If there's ST elevation, that makes things easy because STEMIs are easier to care for than NSTEMIs or the others, or there may be very frequent uh, malignant arrhythmias. So your working diagnosis, as you see this patient in the emergency room, is possible NSTEMI, possible STEMI. And then obviously you get your high sensitivity troponin. And if it's not abnormal, this is not an infarct. This is unstable angina. And we're not gonna talk about the unstable angina today. 
but that troponin really helps you. If the patient is having ongoing symptoms, you may want to repeat the ECG and repeat the troponin. The, the typical troponin will have a rise and fall, but that troponin tells you that both NSTEMI and STEMI are in the works, but it does not differentiate between an NSTEMI and a STEMI. So then let's, let's look at, at what you do. And we did these in pictures because I think it's, <clears throat> it's easier to look at the pictures than to read a paragraph of text. And we, we spent a fair bit of time trying to refine these pictures. So here you have your chest pain patient. You're doing the EKG, the physical, get the clinical history, get the vital signs, and get the high sensitivity troponin. If your working diagnosis is STEMI, that is really easy. And all you have to be sure is that that ST elevation is not pericarditis or something else. But if this is a STEMI, then you, if you have a PCI available institution, that patient goes to PCI. If not, and you know, we're spoiled here because we have 24 and 7 PCI at any of the hospitals where you've trained. That's not the case in rural America. It's not the case in many other communities. So you have to have that possibility. And those patients, if they can't get to a PCI-enabled facility within 90 minutes, they get fibrinolysis and then transfer. It's important as you look at the NSTEMIs that you differentiate them. And the one important thing that you will have to do immediately in the emergency department is to say, is this a very, high, very high risk NSTEMI? And I'll go through the list in a moment of what makes this patient very high risk. Because they get treated like a STEMI. They go right to the cath lab or they get fibrinolysis and transfer to cath. And then there are the NST elevation ACS that, that are high risk, but don't have very high risk characteristics. And we'd like to get them cathed within the first 24 hours, but it's not the emergency of time is muscle that you see with a STEMI. And then the early invasive angiography is really where you want to go for the STEMI. Uh, very high risk and STEMIs, the same thing. And probably for the just high risk and STEMIs, try within the first 24 hours. And you know, this is what the cath lab people have to triage. If they have three or four chest pain patients, who is the end STEMI, who is the very, very high risk, who is the STEMI? And that's the order that they get onto the table. Now, there may be some other tests that you do along the line, but they should not delay the cath lab for those who have to go immediately. Uh, you, you can do an echo, and that often helps. Uh, you can do intravascular imaging, but that is really more in the purview of my cardiology colleagues. You're not making that decision. But more and more, as the availability is there and it doesn't take that much time, we find that it facilitates PCI. You certainly are going to be following the course of the uh, enzymes and watching the ECG. And then what happens is the patients will go on if the anatomy is appropriate, either to PCI or to bypass surgery. And then the other thing, and really as primary care and internists, you're the bookends on this. You manage the patient at initial assessment. They spend their time with invasive management, and then they're back again in your purview where you decide on the long-term medical strategy on lifestyle. And what we've done, because smoking cessation is so important, we've separated out smoking cessation from the other lifestyle measures and really cited it. There's some fascinating information that's available in the literature that if the treating physician mentions smoking cessation in the CCU, that there's a higher adoption of smoking cessation. Because the patient says, here, I'm critically ill. If my doctor says smoking is important in this critical situation, maybe he's really, he or she is really serious about it. <coughs> now, back again to the pathways. Very important that we look at the total ischemic time. 
because that is the way we can improve the system. And here we have the total ischemic time. Much of it is patient delay. And that, of course, is where education comes in, community and public education. And then there is a system delay. And the system delay is something that we can handle at our individual institutions. But if a patient doesn't present primarily and calls EMS, you have the patient delay, the EMS delay, which within our EMS system in Metro Atlanta is not substantial, but elsewhere there may be. And then there is the system delay. But ideally, these patients go to a PCI center. Uh, if they don't go to a PCI center or they're in an ambulance and they have an ACS, they should be sent to a PCI center if that's feasible, or if not, they get fibrinolysis and transfer. The interesting thing in Europe is that in many metropolitan areas, they have all the hospitals who do intervention, who do acute PCI. And sometimes they'll have the admitting hospital for Monday and everything comes to that hospital. That hospital puts all the resources into the acute care. And then they have the remainder of the week to take care of those patients. Because on Tuesday, the acute patients go to another hospital, et cetera. It's probably efficient for the system the problem is the patients often don't get to the hospital where the treating physician practices. So the good and the bad. And then what is it that you're gonna be doing within the first couple of hours? Because that's where these troponins are really important. And here it is in the patient who has a suspected end STEMI that is not very, very high risk. So they're not immediately going to the cath lab. And you, check the pattern of the troponin. Some of the times, if you think the story is really good and the first troponin isn't high enough, you'll find the second or maybe the third one will be elevated. If they have very low or normal initial troponin, they're ruled out. So they either have a non-cardiac cause of their chest pain or unstable angina. Uh, again, some of them you'll have to watch for a little while longer, but if there's a diagnostic troponin, they've been ruled in for an ACS. Now, what do you do uh, with the strategy for reperfusion therapy? And again, here are the patients with an ACS. This cardiogram may be reasonably normal, but more often than not, they'll have some repolarization abnormality. If they're in a non-PCI center or the ambulance, you get them up to a PCI center. But here is something very important that I think should guide what we do. These are the NSTEMIs that are at very high risk and should be managed almost the way a STEMI is. If they have hemodynamic instability or cardiogenic shock, recurrent or ongoing chest pain, if they have acute heart failure, which is some way that some of the NSTEMIs may present, if they have life-threatening arrhythmias, uh, if they have, uh, any sort of mechanical complications, ruptured papillary muscle, VSD, et cetera, or if they have recurrent or dynamic EKG changes uh, that suggest ischemia to you. So those very high risk certainly go to the cath lab. We don't use the GRACE score that much, but by and large, you've confirmed that they have an NSTEMI uh, because of the EKG and the dynamic changes. And if they have any of these, let's get them to the cath lab within 24 hours. And uh, the others, you can wait. And then we'll be talking about what is it that you do once you get into the cath lab. That's not your decision, but you need to know why it is that, that the operators in the cath lab will make the decision for just infarct-related artery opening, for complete revascularization, and what is the evidence? And amazingly, there really is a good body of evidence, some of it from RCTs, that really has helped guide what we do. And most importantly, that has been shown to improve patient outcomes. You see, we're not looking just for open arteries. We're looking for, does that open artery improve the patient outcome? Now, 
Patients don't know they're only supposed to have one illness. So many of the patients who come in with an ACS may have another indication for oral anticoagulation. So we put in two pathways, one for the patients who are not on oral anticoagulants and one for those who are. And I think these are things that can help you in terms of patient management. But here are patients that don't require oral anticoagulants. So that if they have a STEMI and they're going for PCI, they certainly uh, should get unfractionated heparin or an oxaparin or bivalirudin uh, or fondaparinux. Uh, if they have a non-STACS, a non it's unfractionated heparin uh, and oxaparin or fondaparinux. No fondaparinux for the patients with STEMI. That's important. Uh, routine uh, antiplatelet therapy. Certainly everybody gets aspirin. Uh, they uh, certainly we got a PTY12 inhibitor, but you don't do a PTY12 inhibitor right away in the NST elevation MI. You don't do that until after the procedure is over. Then they have invasive coronary angio. And here the choice is really cath lab determined, but by and large, it's either prasigil or ticagrelor. But if it's not available or for patients at very high bleeding risk, it may be clopidogrel. But then here's where you're now going to come in. What's going to happen when that patient returns to you from the cath lab? And here we're now looking in a matter of months. It will be aspirin and a P2Y12 inhibitor, dual antiplatelet therapy, optimally for 12 months. But I'll show you what some of the options are. And then after that, the recommendations previously were for aspirin. Remember, our database for this closed in June of last year, before the reports at ESC and before the ones that we're going to be getting next week at American Heart. I'll tell you what my predictions are. My predictions are we're going to be leaning away from aspirin and more toward the P2Y12 because the efficacy seems comparable and the bleeding risk is less with the P2Y12. And then what are we worried about? We're giving these drugs to protect the patient and the artery, but we really don't want bleeding risk. And what do you do after an ACS? So you may want to abbreviate the time uh, that, you, that you use dual antiplatelet therapy. And in the high bleeding risk patients, some people will say just a month of DAP. That to me is cutting it very close. But if this is a patient with a, re a recent bleed, et cetera, that may be appropriate. Uh, three months of DAP, probably better. Six months of DAP, ideal. And then going on long-term to a P2Y12 inhi inhibitor or aspirin monotherapy. What we've not addressed in this guideline, and I think hopefully some of the US guidelines will address, is what do you do in a patient who's remote from an ACS and who's on long-term aspirin therapy, now that we're recommending a P2Y12. Do you switch them or not? And very often I'll have a discussion with the patient, but we really don't have any guidelines yet. Bleeding risk is less with P2Y12 inhibitor than with aspirin, efficacy very common. And then there is a, a pathway here for DAP de-escalation strategies. And, uh, Certainly, we like to start out in the cath lab with aspirin and prasugrel or aspirin and ticagrelor, but these have a greater bleeding risk than does clopidogrel. And you may, if you're worried about bleeding, want to go back to clopidogrel. But remember, a sizable proportion of patients are unresponsive or hyporesponsive to clopidogrel. And here you have the time to do the test for responsiveness. It's not an acute decision. Before you Switch, do the tests and make sure you're not switching the patient to a regimen to which they're going to be unresponsive. Now, what about the patients who require oral anticoagulation? Probably the most frequent indication that we'll see will be atrial fibrillation. The others may have mechanical heart valves, recent DVT, et cetera. And here we have patients who have had an ACS, but who must be on oral anticoagulation. And typically what we do 
is at least for the first month, triple antiplatelet therapy. So that's their oral anticoagulant and the standard DAPT. And you have to realize that these patients are at high risk for bleeding during that period of time. And you almost never want to send them for any invasive procedure, certainly not any surgery. So you have to realize that's a high bleeding risk. And then after about a month, you would switch them to uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, which would typically be a NOAC and single medication, either B2Y12 inhibitor or aspirin. And then after that, you can de-escalate and long-term after about a year, because during the first year you want to give them the antiplatelet drug, but after a year they can be on their oral anticoagulant and don't require any antiplatelet there. And I'm not even gonna address the question of devices for atrial fibrillation, that's another area. But here, if you want to reduce the ischemic risk, because you're balancing bleeding risk and ischemic risk all the time, you may want to have triple antiplatelet therapy for a little bit longer and then going up to dual and then long-term uh, anticoagulant uh, monotherapy. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on intravascular imaging. That's more for my cardiology colleagues. But sometimes there's a very clear evidence for an infarct-related artery and it's going to be opened. But as you'll see, there are some recommendations for complete revascularization. And often we're not sure how much obstruction there is. And there really is major advantage to using IVUS or optimal uh, coherence tomography, both of which are available in our cath labs here in, in, uh, at Grady. And, and we use them very, very often because they'll help make decisions on whether this is a significant vessel. But this is more cath lab, so I'm not going to spend much time with it. And then what do you do about multivessel disease? Early on, we open the infarct-related artery. But one of the things that we've seen over time, and probably the reason the patients who go to bypass surgery do better over the long time, is that they get more complete revascularization. So what we were looking at in the clinical trials is in the cath lab, what are the indications for more complete revascularization? Where you don't want to go there is the patient who presents in cardiogenic shock. You give them the presses, you get them to the cath lab right away because you're assuming that ischemia is the main precipitant. They get the immediate PCI of only the infarct-related artery. And then with a class 2A recommendation, Maybe later on, they'll do complete revascularization. And that really depends on what they do clinically and what their echocardiogram does and how you titrate their medications. The STEMI now, the Europeans are much more aggressive and they're recommending completely re revascularization either during the initial period or within 28, 48 days, uh, six weeks, a month and a half. And for the non-ST elevation ACSs, recommending complete revascularization with a 2A, not a class one, with a 2A. And there's one study that, that says, let's functionally uh, evaluate the non-IRA related artery. When I see a 2B recommendation, I look at it, I say, maybe there's one little study, let's think about it, but it doesn't typically move me to do anything. Now, long-term management, because this is your purview now, and this is where you're going to see the patients, and this is your responsibility. And very often, you're going to see a patient with an ACS who was never sick before. More commonly, men. Women will more often have antecedent angina before an ACS. For men, the presentation is often myocardial infarction. And you really have to sit down with the patient, explain what's happened, explain what a good job you've done about opening the arteries, et cetera, and then define what the insurance policy is for that procedure. And that's really the way I explain long-term therapy, that what we're going to do, this is lifelong therapy, this is the insurance policy on your trip to the cath lab. And 
we've divided them into three things. One is the lifestyle. The second is uh, what you're going to do with the management. And then we specifically said goals of therapy. Lifestyle, the things you know, smoking cessation, uh, a healthy diet, regular exercise, healthy weight, and psychosocial management. And we put psychosocial management into this because so many patients have anxiety, depression, et cetera. We have the resources here to refer them for care. And we're not doing that often enough. And then <clears throat> in terms of uh, the medications that we use, we'll do the antithrombotic therapy, the lipid lowering therapy, uh, annual influenza vaccine. That's in every one of the guidelines. And really very important because these patients get flu. They're going to be very, very sick. And one of the things that I'm using in my clinic, and those of you who rotated with me know, is I'll tell the patients as you see them that we didn't have much flu over the last couple of years because we were all masked and there wasn't that transmission. And during that time, that flu vaccine has managed, the flu itself has managed to mutate and it's getting worse. So the flu we're seeing now is going to be more significant than what we've seen in the last couple of years. And the current vaccine addresses the current status of the flu organism and people should get vaccinated. Uh, where am I now? Uh, and, and, and then the, the, the drug adherence and the other treatments is appropriate. And you really have to tell the patients that they have to get used to taking medications. Patients have not taken medications and most of these people will go home on a minimum of four and probably five medications. And you have to tell them what each one is for. Because if you tell them they're all their heart medicines, they'll pick and choose which they want to take which day. So be really careful. And I'll tell you what, so, what some of the Europeans are doing in terms of teaching and what we, we may have to add to us. And then in terms of the goal, the goal of systolic blood pressure is 120 over 80 for everybody. Now, if you have a frail elderly patient, I stand them up and make sure they're not orthostatic and use my clinical judgment. Uh, we want an LDL below 55 and we want a hemoglobin A1C below seven. Europeans don't differentiate by age. Here, we'll give a little bit more leeway on the A1C to older patients. And then this is what came from having a patient on our group. Uh, what is the person-centered approach to their ACS journey? If you're seeing them in your clinic before they have an event, when they're at risk because they have risk factors, you have to consider all their risk factors. You establish what the medical history is and consider the psychosocial. At admission, you have to individualize the care at triage and patient-centered assessment. Even though this is an acute setting, this is shared decision-making. And you have to have your elevator speech ready to give to the patient to say what's going on and what are their options and what is it that you recommend and why. And you have to be able to do this like this. Our cardiology fellows, I think I could wake them up at 2 a.m. and they'd be able to do that. And then shared decision-making. Because there are some patients who say, I don't want anything done. And then you define for them what the risks, but they don't want anything done, they don't want anything done. And then preparing for discharge, you explain the long-term treatments, you educate that about lifestyle, and then uh, you consider mental and emotional health. And what is it that our patients expect? They expect that their symptoms will be recognized, that you know what you're doing, that their physical, mental, and emotional well-being will be considered, and that there'll be support for their family and caregivers. They want high quality, effective, and safe care. That's your responsibility. They want clear and comprehensible information. And we here, in addition, have problems with translation. And be sure that the patient understands, do the teach back, particularly when you're working with a translator, to be sure the patient understands what's going on, and attention to both their physical and environmental needs. And they want the right care at the right time and the right decision and a clean and safe hospital environment. And sometimes we look around and see it's not there. It's our responsibility to tell somebody to make that clean and safe. <laughs>
Now, what I'm gonna do is spend the next, next few minutes on just about the dozen of new recommendations because we addressed a whole batch of things, antiplatelet, cardiac arrest, technical aspects, cardiogenic shock, multivariate disease, and all kinds of complications. And you are going to see these and have to make some of these decisions. And you know the way that you do the recommendations. Class one is in green, everybody should do it. Class two comes in two flavors. One, a stronger recommendation, and the two B, possibly, probably, and three, no benefit or may produce harm. And then the level of evidence, those are the same as we use in the states. R multiple randomized trials of meta-analysis is A, B is single randomized trial, a large non-randomized, and C is basically expert opinion. And there's some areas where we're never gonna have a randomized trial. So when people say there are a lot of class C recommendations, that's because a randomized trial is not feasible. So a class C recommendation mean, hopefully the smartest people you could assemble gave you their best judgment. That's not bad. Now, patients who come in with an acute coronary syndrome, you send them to bypass grafting. They should resume DAP after surgery for at least 12 months because their presentation was not bypass surgery. Their presentation was an ACS. That's class one recommendations. Older patients, particularly if they're at high bleeding risk, consider clopidogrel as the P2Y12 receptor. But the data there are weak. They're just a couple of studies and uh, high bleeding risk, frail elderly patients. And I worry about the word frail because you assume that a frail patient is going to fall. And I don't want to look at a fall risk. I want to know if they've fallen. If they've fallen, they're at high risk. If I look at them and I think they're frail and they're ambulatory and they've never fallen, they're not that high risk. And I think that's an important differentiation. There are 15 frailty scores. Uh, they're all fair to good. But really, the most important question you ask is, have they fallen? Now, what about alternative antithrombotic regimens? If they have no events after three to six months of death, they're not at high ischemic risk, they're not having recurrent pain, et cetera, maybe you should start single antiplatelet therapy at six months rather than a year. That's a two-way recommendation. And then as an alternative to aspirin for long-term it's 2B based on the recommendation on the data in last June. I think it's going to become a 2A or maybe even a 1 as some of the new data emerge. Now, high bleeding risk patients. After one month of therapy, remember I showed you that you may consider dual antiplatelet therapy, but that's a 2B recommendation. And then if they're on oral anticoagulants, withdrawing antiplatelet therapy at six months instead of a year, that's a 2B. If they can tolerate it, I'd rather keep it for a year. And then de-escalation, this is really important. De-escalation of antiplatelet therapy in the first 30 days, not recommended. They need the triple antiplatelet therapy for the first 30 days. And here is something where you will have to make a decision evaluation of the neurologic prognosis if there's an out-of-hospital arrest, no earlier than 72 hours after admission. Don't call your friendly neurologist until 72 hours. Uh, and that's a class one recommendation because the earlier assessment is not worth it. And then we don't have cardiac arrest centers, but in Europe there are some, and they will transport patients to cardiac arrest centers because they have separate resources. Now, this I think is important. In patients whose ACS was a SCAD, a spontaneous coronary dissection, most commonly younger women, PCI is recommended only for the unstable patient because that SCAD is going to resolve by itself. And it, you, if you intervene, you may worsen the dissection. And also if you put in a stent, that stent is not gonna be opposed. And when that SCAD resolves, you'll have an unopposed scent, which puts the patient at risk. So you treat those very differently. And I've, I've just talked about the intravascular image to guide PCI. 
and possibly using OCT. Now, again, patients with cardiogenic shock, we discussed that stage PCI should be continued, but basically just go for the infarct-related artery. And then the hemodynamically stable STEMI patients, uh, obviously the, the angiographic severity should tell you whether you want to go after the non uh, infarct related artery, but don't do functional assessment in the in an acute setting. That takes time. You don't want the patient on the cath table forever. Now, what about the complications? Because you're going to see this during the five to seven days the patient is in the hospital with you. If there's high degree AV block and it doesn't resolve within five days before you send the patient home, permanent pacemaker. You don't want to bring them back for another procedure, et cetera, and to see what happens. And they may have to be paced. Remember, you're putting them on a beta blocker. You're putting them on a lot of medication that, that is going to alter uh, their, their heart rate. Implant that pacemaker. And then if you're worried about an LV thrombus and the images aren't that good, uh, consider cardiac MRI. And for the patient who has an anterior MI, where you're not sure whether there's an LV thrombus because that's the indication of anticoagulation. You don't see it well on echo. Uh, either a contrast echo or an MRI can be done. And then here is one where we're, we're not doing this enough. In patients who have high-grade AV block with an anterior infarct and heart failure, earlier device implantation for possible CRT, but you need the wide QRS for that. And then we've seen a few of these patients with recurrent life-threatening arrhythmias, sedation or general anesthesia to reduce sympathetic drive. That's a 2B, meaning there are a couple of little studies that have shown benefit. But if you have life-threatening persistent ventricular arrhythmias, this is a nice place to start. Now, all of these patients are going to have comorbidities. And we really punted on the choice of long-term glucose lowering. And what we said is that therapy will vary with comorbidities, including heart failure, chronic kidney disease, and obesity. And I think you see we're all leaning toward the SGLT2 inhibitors. But there, at that time, there still was not a good enough data set in the setting of ACS. We'll see. And then frail older patients, a holistic approach is recommended, but this is what we do anyway. We look to say, what are the risks and benefits of each particular therapy and how much will these patients get? And then we're seeing more and more cancer patients who have an ACS. And we spent a little bit of time, and I think this is going to be helpful to you, is that if the patients present with a high-risk ACS, they're expected to survive more than six months. Invasive strategy recommended. And I think this will help your decision-making. If cancer therapy is interrupted during the ACS, if it's, expect, it's expected to be a contributing cause, typically checkpoint inhibitors or something like that, but then restart it afterward. And then in those ACS patients with cancer who have a bad prognosis, estimated survival less than six months, don't do anything dramatic, and basically a conservative non-invasive strategy recommended. So six months is sort of the arbitrary limit, and here's where our uh, cancer colleagues can help us with that decision. And then here is one where you're going to have to make decisions. Cancer patients with a platelet count under 10,000, no aspirin risk greater than the benefit. Cancer patients with a platelet count under 30,000, no clopidogrel. And cancer patients with a platelet count under 50,000, no prasugrel or ticagrelor. And these are non-randomized trial data, but the observation of the people who've looked at them, this is where they bleed. So the bleeding risk is greater than the benefit. And then some recommendations for long-term management. And I'm hoping you'll do this. Intens patients who were on lipid-lowering therapy during their ACS, intensify it so that they are on high-dose statin. 
And then there's a recommendation from culture, for culture scene based on the Paul Ridger study uh, because it has shown slight benefit. It's a 2B recommendation. I'm sort of very lukewarm about that one. But this one, I'm enthusiastic. High dose statin plus azetamide, consider it during the index hospitalization. Remember, high dose statin, you're going to get a 30% decrease in LDL. If you're lucky, you may get a little bit more. And if you want more than 30%, you may use high dose statin plus azetamide. So these are things that will help you. And then a lot of patient centered care because you have to use patient values to inform the clinical decision include patients in decision making. And what I'm hoping we're going to develop over time here is the Europeans use a lot of decision aids to help in discussion. They use a lot of pictures, which is sort of why we went to the pictures in all of our uh, tables. They have pictures in the emergency room to help the patients describe the pain of where it is and whether it's sticky, stabby, oppressively heavy, what have you. So they're using decision aids and they're available generally. Those are available online. And if you've had challenge with a patient, you may want to try and see if they work. And then most of the thing that, that is being done much in Europe is using the teach back technique for decision support with informed consent and even lifestyle. Meaning you're saying, tell me what I told you. And it's amazing what you think you said and what the patient heard. And it's, it's, it's worth a couple of minutes. And then patient discharge information, written and verbal format, and assessment of mental well-being before discharge. But this is one that I hope that you'll have on your handheld, because this is the essentially the approach of what are the things that you think about. That's the spectrum of ACS. I've given you what A stands for and C and S. And then think about invasive management. Urgent for the STEMIs and the very high risk and STEMIs. Think about antithrombotic therapy. Think about revascularization. And think about secondary prevention. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you so much. That's um, really um, remarkable um, and an incredible um, body of work and um, and review of that. Um, I uh, encourage people to put questions into the chat. Um, uh, I, I just, you know, was intrigued from the very get go that you described first off a, um, a guidelines recommendation system that included patient voices, and I was wondering. You know, you talked about where those contributions took place, but I was wondering if you could actually expand on that. Were they were there patients in every sort of deliberation, or were there, you know, um, times when you um, included, you know, patient considerations and so on? Because I think you know we talk about this a lot in HIV medicine, and I suspect um, in other areas this has become an area of more focus as well. well you know, Dr. Armstrong, we had a patient as a member of the writing group. And Mary Galbraith had been a working woman and a professional. She's from the UK, but she was a patient. She was very, very vocal. And anytime we made a recommendation that she thought would not be understandable to the patient, she would call us on it. She was on these morning calls all the time and really made us think about what we were saying, how we were saying it, and what was important to patients. Remember, you're dealing with uh, ESC, which is bas basically national health systems. So th there's a uniformity of care in these nations that we don't have here. And the uniformity of care there is now expanding to include patient expectations. No, I think that's fantastic. And that actually um, leads to another question, which is, um, you know, here you are working on the other side of the pond, as you put it. Um, uh, you just described one difference in care, which is um, an expect, you know, including patient expectations. What other sort of differences did you notice in this process between care um, in the U.S. care systems, health systems in the U.S. versus um, in uh, Europe? 
Well, I expect the one that we see most here at Grady in the population we serve, but also seen at the private institutions is the accessibility and availability of care and accessibility and availability of medications. And these guidelines are the ones that guide the medications in Europe that are on the formulary. That's not the case in the US. It sounds like you feel like maybe that ought to be the case in the US. <laughs> I'm not gonna get into the discussion of the National <laughs> okay. Health Service. Okay. And that's for another uh, time. Sure. Um, and so Dr. Kubedes is asking, what's the best approach for someone with recent PCI and high risk of bleeding? Well, again, th that is the potential de-escalation. If they require anticoagulant therapy, you still need triple therapy for one month, but you really want to begin to de-escalate to single uh, antiplatelet therapy as rapidly as feasible. But remember, you behave differently if the patient is having recurrent ischemic symptoms or not, because you're balancing bleeding risk and ischemic risk. Yeah, and I really sort of appreciated that emphasis throughout. Uh, other questions? The audience. All right. Well, hearing none, Dr. Wenger. No, wait a minute. There's, we've got a oh, question in the back of the room here. Oh, fantastic. You'll have to repeat it for us. Yeah, you come, come on up here and share my microphone. <laughs> uh, I was wondering about the, if there's any concurrent um, talk with uh, the neurologist about the simultaneous presentation of NSTEMI or STEMI and stroke, because we see that so often in our grading population. Well, Again, I think one of the features is when you see these concomitantly, which do you think was the trigger and which do you think was the response? Because in the setting of stroke, the first thing that you look at is to say, is this a type two myocardial infarction, which is treated very differently? Does a myocardial infarction result as a complication? And I think this is where you sit down with your neurologist. Do not do it on the email. <laughs> you sit down with your with your neurologist, and each of you presents your side of it, and then you make an informed decision. But I think very often th this is a type two MI, which means that you don't go for the invasive strategy. Um, I, I appreciate that teaching point too, sitting down with people and um, and talking directly. Um, I'm. Uh, I, I don't know if you'll want to get into this one either or not. Given your experience working closely and developing these and other recs with countries with national healthcare systems, could you return another time and discuss your thoughts on a path forward to universal care in the U.S.? Let's let's sit down with a glass of wine and do that in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, all right. Any other any other questions? Okay, well, there's uh, thank yous in the chat. Thank you, Dr. Wenger, for the detailed review and your extraordinary example of service and leadership in this effort. I wanna second that. Um, really um, appreciate you um, uh, really laying this out for the non-cardiologist here um, to, to, to follow clearly um, where the important changes here are. Okay, and just remember, just you can go to the journal, you can copy off any of the figures, they are for general use. They do not require permission. And I hope to see you using some of them. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you.